So as I said, my talk is building a, a web application with zero budget. And I'm a so software developer with an interest in science and citizen science. And this past winter, I was part of an open life science mentorship program. And during that program, I partnered up with um, some iNaturalist project organizers to build some data exploration tools for their iNaturalist project. And iNaturalist is a citizen science project where they ask um, people to take photos and document the biodiversity in their area. So one of the th topics in Science Gateways is always, um, how can we keep the site going after the initial funding period um, runs out? So one of the questions I had besides just how do I build a site is, how do I build a site with, with in mind that in the future, there's gonna be zero budget. So I'm, I'll do a quick demo of the site now. Okay. So the site, I partnered up with five different um, project organizers and I'll just pick this one. And as you can see, they have custom about pages and in the explore data section is, I wanna build tools where the project organizers could upload their iNaturalist observations and um, some environmental data. So you can search for species or you can preload sets. And as you zoom in and out, you know, things changes. And we also, because they wanna see changes over space and time. So you can see charts of it in month and years. And as you zoom in and out, the charts changes and you can also filter to the charts. And then that also affects what appears on the map. And we also show some basic uh, environmental data, which is temperature and pre precipitation. And on the species page, um, as you can see, it's interactive. You can see it broken up. And when you click on each species, you also have more interactions of click, click one, see an observations, zoom in and out, things change, and also more charts that are interactive. And we are we also oh, grabbing more map data from iNaturalist in terms of range maps. And I'm also grabbing data from the Global Biotic Interactions um, API in order to show um, how things interact. And like right now I'm just showing mainly uh, food webs of what, what eats and what is eaten by a particular species. And all these clink links are visible. And we also have an observer page where you can see the observations for each person. So let's see, now going back to the thing, um, to the talk um, is keeping in mind, I come from a private sector background um, in, I started my career in a private sector uh, software. So the idea of maintainability and sustainability was very new to me. So in order to think about these things, I had to rethink about how I rebuild websites. And what I did was combine ideas from both the tech world and the research world in order to build the site. Number one thing I used, which GitHub pages, which started in tech world, but is coming more popular in the research world to host simple sites. Um, pick that um, so that researchers are least familiar with this. And I think this is probably one of the fancier GitHub pages I've seen personally. And number two, I in, from the tech world, I use the idea of using static site generators, which will take your data and some templates and create some HTML pages. And there are many static site generators available. And I, since I knew that I wanted lots of interactivity, I picked a static site generator called um, SvelteKit which is written in JavaScript. 
And one thing that I took from the research world was this idea of using CSV as a data source. And using Jupyter Notebooks to, manipul to manipulate um, Jupyter Notebooks and Pandas to manipulate this, this CSVs in order to form the, the data model that I needed for the website. So I originally only had one CSV for observations, which I got from iNaturalist. And then I was able to use Pandas to separate them into three CSVs, one for observation, one for taxa, and one for users. And another idea I took from the research world is the idea of prefetching the API data and saving it to the CSV instead of making live API calls. And by combining these ideas, I have ended up with a site where there's zero hosting cost, zero server cost, and zero database cost. So the pros of this tech stack is that, as I say, zero operating cost. And since there's no database or servers, it's less, less stuff to break, so less maintenance. And hopefully, by being low cost and less maintenance, um, it increases the sustainability. The cons of this, this particular tech stack is that you need to regenerate the pages if the data changes. And right now, I, count, I have about 18,000 files because I'm creating one page for each taxa, hence all the files. And it takes, takes about 10 minutes of build time. Um, and because I don't have a database, that means no user login and you get the same content for all visitors. And one of the limitations is that since we're loading the CSV into the browser memory, the number of records you can have is limited by the size of the CSV. You don't want people downloading 50 meg CSVs into their browser. And if anyone's interested in trying to this going for this approach, I think one of the things that I had to think about was the compromise between features, cost, and sustainability. It's like, as I mentioned in the previous page, there are some features that I had to give up, like user login. But, in, but what I gain is zero cost. But there were other things like map tiles. You know, Google Maps, Esri, they have nicer map tiles, but those do cost money. So I picked, on, I used the free, um, freely available map tiles. And in order to make the compromises, it took a lot of communication between me and the project organizers to figure out what, what ideas I had to, that I could compromise for, what features that it's like, okay, those aren't really important. So if I don't include those, it's fine. And if they suggest an idea, then I could also offer alternatives. It's like, well, if we do it this way, it gives you 80% of what you want, but zero cost. And most importantly, it, you need an opportunity to try new things. I've never built a site with CSVs, and it was my first time using SvelteKit. Never even thought of the idea of using pandas as a for a data model, data modeling. So, but so far it worked out okay. Um, Acknowledgements: the Open Life Science Program that gave me the chance to meet iNaturalist organizers and guidance to help build the site, the iNaturalist project organizers, and all the open source software and open data resources that allows one developer to create a website. And here's the contact info. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I think that was not. Someone is talking in the background. I don't know how to. Okay. So, yeah, thank you very much for this great talk. So, if there are any questions, please um, unmute yourself or add it in, in the chat. So, so I, I would have a question because I'm working also with GitHub pages for some project. And so 
trying out all these different aspects and you are really looking also into sustainability. Um, so what, so to give, for example, to give it to someone else also, what would be your recommendation to use the ex same software stack um, to try maybe for some aspect, something else uh, for the features? What would be if someone would like to follow your model here? Would I would be? say, um, well, if you want interactive, you need someone who knows JavaScript. Um, so you can pick a static site generator that uses JavaScript. You don't have to use SvelteKit. There are other ones available, but you do need J JavaScript. Um, so that's one thing. And check, it, this works for, I would say, small to medium things. Like I have one CSV with 10,000 records. And it and it works fine. So you have to make if you have like a million records, I wouldn't recommend this because you know you would have to load a million records into your browser and that that, that won't be fun. So I, I would say that. And um so that would be my two recommendations. But if you want, what else would I recommend? Um start off with a small pro small project and see um like if it works for for you and have good communications. Um, and I guess that would be it. Or you could just hire us to do it because I work at a software consultancy. So you can always email me and, or my boss and go, hey, can we have a discussion? So that's another way. OK, great, thanks. So we have more questions in the chat. So Chunha, Yong, you, you would like to? Ask your question, just unmute you yourself. Yeah, I think, okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Chiro course is always welcome. So, <laughs> so yeah, why did you solve the stack in that case? Just only use a JavaScript toolkit or some, something other, just like a millions of CSV files, that's it? Uh, yep, I use CSVs and JavaScript. And I had to use pandas, Python pandas, in uh -huh. order to reshape the, the CSVs. Oh, okay, got it. Thanks. And I, in the contact page, I do have a link to the GitHub repo. So all the code uh -huh. is available online. I'll put a link in the chat too, so you can browse through it. Great, thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you very much. So the next question from Ryan was also, is there a link to a GitHub repo, sample template, the website? Yeah. So, uh, and the other, we, we will also publish in Synodo the abstracts. So, but the, you know, the, the links will be available. Okay, any further questions? Thank you so much again, and uh, we are going to the next speaker. Okay, that is me. Let me just get my sh screen sharing here. Yeah, so everybody can see my uh, title screen there. Yes, yes. Okay, um, so just a, a quick talk about a project we're working with um, at the Galaxy Project, um, which is a, a, a platform for performing uh, genetic analysis. Um, this is developed by uh, some of the team at Johns Hopkins University, NS Afghan, myself, uh, Bridget Carr, and Victor Wen, which are two of our um, intern students. Uh, Michael Schatz is uh, one of the PIs on the Galaxy project. And then we've also got uh, Nguyen, who's actually uh, University of Australia, Melbourne, I believe. Um, uh, but actually in uh, uh, Sri Lanka. Um, so just a, a quick overview. We'll talk a little bit about the motivation, why we're doing what we're doing, uh, talk a little bit about setting up our infrastructure, um, the experiment design, um, ABM, which is, stands for Automated uh, Benchmarking, which is a um, uh, Python library we developed to automate a lot of the projects. Um, talk about uh, the dashboard we hope to develop and data visualization of our results, and then just a, a word or two 
about the results that we have um, found so far. Um, so the uh, big motivation for this is trying to understand the costs involved on running Galaxy on um, the various commercial cloud providers. Um, uh, both Google and Amazon and Microsoft with Azure uh, provide, uh, you know, clusters that you can go and uh, run, but we want to make sure that people are using uh, these resources efficiently, that they understand the type and scale of the resources um, they're going to require, uh, some reasonable understanding of the costs that are going to be involved very often when people are planning uh, a project to um, or an experiment that they want to run, uh, some analysis that they want to run, they don't really have a good sense of uh, what they require and what they need because the the solution space of the configurations that you can have is mind-numbingly large. From the the types of VM that you have, uh, how many CPUs does that VM have? How many uh, CPUs does it have? How much memory does it have? What operating system does it run? Red Hat costs more than Ubuntu, um, et cetera, et cetera. It costs more to run on the East Coast than it does on the West Coast. Um, and having a suboptimal configuration means that you're either wasting resources, um, uh, you've, you've provisioned servers that you're actually not using fully, or you're wasting time and uh, money. Now at Galaxy, we have decades worth of uh, historical data of uh, analysis and performance runs that have been done, but that data tends to be rather noisy. Um, we had no control over the parameters that the user selected when they ran the tools, um, what the data set was, how large it was. It's uh, useful for identifying um, the most common tools, which we did and selected uh, the, the most common tools for both DNA and RNA analysis. Um, but it tended to be a little bit too noisy to be useful um, for the kind of analysis that we wanted to do. So our overall goals for the cloud cost um, project was to determine uh, the various costs on the various platforms for the type of bioinformatics um analysis that might be done and we want to do it in a, a systematic way um, that allows us to modify one variable at a time whether it be the uh, size of the instance the number of cpus it has the number of memory it has uh, and the other runtime things so we can just vary one parameter at a time and see how that affects our um, runtime and then ideally we would like to have a dashboard um, either on Galaxy itself or uh, somewhere else where if someone has a, a given data set and a set of tools that we want to run, we can't give them an exact cost and say, oh, this is going to cost you $75.39. But we can say we ran a similar experiment on using the same tools on a similar data set. And this is the, what we found doing that. So our experiment uh, design, we want to uh, compare uh, the various cloud providers, the Google Cloud Platform, uh, Amazon Web Services, um, and Jetstream. We do have Microsoft Azure on the roadmap uh, someplace out in the uh, distant future. We want to compare the different CPU and RAM ratios. Uh, very often when you're um, configuring these machines, they'll be compute optimized or memory optimized with so many gigabytes of RAM uh, per uh, virtual CPU. So we want to explore with four gigabytes per CPU, eight gigabytes per C CPU, 16 uh, gigabytes per CPU. Also, they offer various CPU architectures. Is AMD faster than Intel? Is uh, Intel Skylake faster than Cascade Lake or Ice Lake? And then, as I said, the scalability of CPUs per tool. Some tools are written better than others and make better use of the resources they're provided. Others so much, and they don't scale as well. You can throw lots of CPU at them and lots of memory, which is lots of money, 
and it doesn't really change the performance. So we want to be able to um, identify all of those things. Now, before we can actually run any benchmarks, we need a Galaxy instance to um, run on. Um, so the first thing we need to do is we need to provision some hardware uh, that set up the virtual machines, uh, allocate some storage, whether we want SSDs or magnetic disks, uh, configure the network, make sure all these machines um, are running together. The various prov uh, providers, uh, Google provides a program called G Cloud that you can use. Uh, Amazon, their version of it is uh, EKS CTL, the Elastic Kubernetes Service Controller, um, that basically allow you to create a, a cluster with a, a single command. And then we use a, a platform called Terraform on Jetstream. Not sure if people are familiar with Jetstream. It's an NSF funded supercomputer running at uh, Indiana. And there's also an instance at uh, Texas. Um, and then once we've got the hardware actually provisioned, we need to install Kubernetes on it. Kubernetes is an orchestration platform uh, that will take a number of individual machines and combine them so that it looks like a, a single uh, a supercomputer. On Google and Amazon, they have managed Kubernetes clusters for you. So when we say G Cloud create a, a cluster, by the time that cluster comes up, um, uh, Kubernetes is already installed. Jetstream doesn't have anything like that. So we need to use some, uh, as I said, uh, Terraform and some Ansible playbooks uh, to actually install uh, uh, Rancher, which is a Kubernetes engine uh, that's freely available. Once we have all the hardware uh, set up, we need to actually install Galaxy. I'm not too sure how many people here are familiar with Kubernetes. Uh, but Kubernetes has a program called Helm. It's basically a package manager for Kubernetes. If you've ever done any um, software installation on Linux, it would be like the apt version of uh, on Ubuntu, or I think it's Yum on uh, CentOS and uh, Red Hat installation. So we can just say Helm install Galaxy, and then it goes and configures, sets up the database, connects Galaxy to the database, connects the uh, front end, the Nginx uh, front end proxy. And then once Galaxy is all set up, we need to actually configure Galaxy um, <clears throat> to be able to run our experiment. Since this is a brand new Galaxy instance, it won't have the data we need. So we need to upload the data. We need to upload workflows. We'll need to create an admin user so they can do all of these things. Um, so that is sort of the infrastructure uh, back end of it. Underneath the hood, it's all Bash scripts. Um, you know, developers everywhere are familiar with Bash and familiar with writing uh, Bash scripts. So developers are um, familiar with it. It's easy to use. Every flavor of Linux has Bash. Even Windows has a, a Bash interpreter. Um, so it runs any everywhere. And then when we do want to, uh, in the future, oh, don't jiggle my mouse. Um, we do want to provide this eventually as sort of benchmarking as a service and run it either on a continuous integration or continuous development systems, uh, something like GitHub Actions. Um, so if we have everything running in place as bash uh, scripts, it's easy to uh, perform and uh, port that to other things. So as I mentioned, we have a, a Python library. It's available on uh, GitHub. Um, you can look at the code there. Uh, we've also installed it to uh, PyPy. Uh, so once you create um, a virtual environment for your Python, you can just say pip install uh, gxabm and um, it will be installed. Um, so it handles most of the automation of Galaxy itself. Um, it can configure Galaxy, create uh, users, get an API key for that user, uh, upload uh, the workflows and uh, data that we need. It is basically a command line front end for APIs that Galaxy already exposes. Uh, the most common uh, API is BioBlend, and it 
you know, communicates with Galaxy. That's what ABM uses to run the workflows and manage the data um, uploads. And then there's also an API called Planemo. Um, it's responsible for uploading um, the workflows. And if a workflow uses a tool that's not installed on that Galaxy instance, it will install all the tooling that is needed for um, that workflow. Uh, ABM also runs the experiment itself. We'll take a little bit of uh, uh, a look at that in a little bit. So it uh, actually runs the experiments um, and then collects the results. And it also is able to manage the Kubernetes clusters. After we have performed one uh, benchmarking run, or we'll do a, a number of benchmarking runs on each configuration, it's able to go and reconfigure our Kubernetes cluster, our Galaxy cluster actually, uh, to change the amount of CPU and memory that is associated with um, each job. So here are some of the, just uh, a picture of the help screen, uh, some of the commands that we can run uh, for managing the benchmarks, uh, the workflows, the data sets. I'll talk a little bit more about those in uh, a moment. Um, we can Beep. also... Yes? Beep, you are at your 13 minutes. <laughs> Oh, um, my, sorry, my timer, is over, my timer says five, so I'll, I, I will speed it up here then. Uh, so some common tools, uh, a quick look at the history. Uh, so um, in uh, ABM, uh, the benchmarks are made up of, or the experiment is made up of a, a benchmark and uh, the experiment just runs a number of the benchmarks. Uh, we'll skip over that. Uh, take a look at some of the, the data that we've generated already that we can, uh, once we have these run on uh, a number of instances, we can then take a look at the costs and the run times that those tools actually did, um, our run times again. Uh, interesting here that we see that increasing the amount of memory available doesn't actually uh, increase the amount of memory used. And in the future, what we want to do is formulate uh, some observable dashboards. Uh, if you're not familiar with observable, um, it's like a Jupyter notebook, um, only it uh, um, focuses on uh, the visualization of the data. And so I guess if I'm out of time, I will wrap it up there if anybody has any questions. Thank you very much. Yes, um, so anyone? can type or unmute themselves for a question. So I, I would ha have a question. So when you set this up as, as services that also other people ca can use it then, because yeah, you, you said that. So will there be something like, for example, a RESTful API that it can be used also programmatically for results or how, how do you plan that? Yeah, we'll probably have a, a REST API um, under the hood that people can query. And then we'll also have um, a, a user interface uh, that people, um, you know, if they set up a, a job to run on Galaxy, uh, that they can say, you know, which provides a, a user interface. Once they've got their job set up, we'll say like, you know, in similar circumstances, um, this is what we, um, exposed as well as um, these dashboards on observable, which I say looks like a, a Jupyter notebook so they can go in and um, uh, explore the data if they're configuring their own Galaxy instance um, to run experiments on, they, you know, it will inform them how to do that. So we'll have a, a user interface that then calls a REST API underneath um, and users will be able to access both. Great, thank you. Any other question? Okay. So thank you so much for, for your great talk. And then I would say we go to the next speaker. The next speaker is Eno Fernandez del Castillo. And I hope I said it right. He will talk about scalable environments for reproducible open science. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Sandra. I'm sharing my screen. Hope you can uh, see it. Um, Looks good. 
There you go. Uh, so yeah, this uh, presentation that uh, was prepared with the help of my colleague Gergi Sipo, both of us working in the EGI Foundation, which is in, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. And well, I, I will tell you about what CEI and, and what is the role that we play in, in the overall European uh, context and how we deal with this reproducible open science. So I will start first with a bit of context uh, on where this work was, was done. Uh, we have one thing called the European Open Science Cloud in Europe, which is an initiative coming from the from the European Commission. And the idea is, well, the motto is to give Europe a global lead in scientific data infrastructure and to ensure the European scientists reap the full benefits of data driven science. The idea is that this EOSC is something that is currently being built on, but we have a couple of years working on this. And at the end, we will have a trusted virtual and federated environment that uh, cuts across borders and scientific disciplines to store, share, process, and reuse research digital objects for the for principles. So overall, the idea is to make uh, data for scientists as open as possible and make things as fair as possible, so you can, yeah, reproduce your science and and just share the knowledge and with that yeah, increasing the the possibility of generating new knowledge and, and so on. Uh, this European Open Science Cloud is being developed as as a series of projects from the European Commission and one that we are leading from the EGI Foundation is EGIAs. Uh, and, and this one here, we have the kind of the objective or the main objective is to implement this, what we call the compute platform of the Europe, European Open Science Cloud. Uh, basically, this is a set of computing providers, uh, uh, services, data spaces, tools, everything as integrated as possible and aligned with other initiatives that are going on in Europe uh, about cloud provisioning, uh, federation and HPC. And will all, all of that support the realization of the, the European Open Science Cloud, looking mostly into the computing uh, delivery of computing resources. This was started in January 2021. Uh, it will last until mid next year. Uh, and we have a budget of 12 million with uh, 33 participating partners. So EGI uh, may not be familiar for you, as most of the people is from the US. EGI is a federation in, in Europe that first deliver advanced computing solutions for research. Uh, we have uh, high throughput computing, high performance computing and, and cloud compute facilities. Uh, mostly in Europe, but we cooperate with, uh, with the rest of the world. You can see here a map of, of the different data centers where we have some, some connection with. Um, we also, although the US is there empty, it's because that's mostly managed by OSC, but we do collaborate with uh, OSC and have uh, links there. Uh, we have uh, the broadband network connectivity provided by GIAN, the European Research Network, uh, and, and we, on top of that, create a, a common trust and identity model and policies, uh, develop middleware to use these uh, services and support the, 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 the execution of, the, uh, of scientific computing applications and the analysis of data on top of that. Um, so with this infrastructure, the EGIA's project and the EOS context, what we want to do is uh, deliver tools that allow us to uh, make it easier to reproduce uh, science. And for that, we try to focus on, on, on a set of basic tools, which are the ones here in, in the slide. The first one will be Jupyter. So I, I, I'm quite sure you're familiar with that and, and people have already mentioned this in the, in the previous talks. This is basically an interface to, to interactively code and create solutions to the problem. You, you have a rich ecosystem of languages, libraries, so you can run Python, R, Julia, and, and many others. And then you have these pieces of text or documents with code and images, which are the notebooks, which are very easy to share and, and are kind of self-contained that so you can communicate research easily. So that would be kind of our our main thing that we want to reproduce, the Jupyter Notebooks. And we will do it with two more things. The second one would be Zenodo. Zenodo is an open repository to, to deposit any kind of research object, papers, data, software, reports, anything. Uh, it's basically openly available. Anyone can go there, create an account, and, and put something up. Um, it's integrated with GitHub, which is very convenient for, for our um, 
situation what we want to do with uh, with the reproducibility and also generates DOIs for for whatever you deposit there so it's very convenient if you want to cite it in a publication whenever you you need it and the third part would be binder I, i'm also quite sure that lots of people know about my binder which is a, an open instance of this software that it's available to create a reproducible environment as docker containers basically binder takes a git repository from github for example builds a docker container uh, from that that it's always the same for a given git um, commit let's say and makes it uh, or run runs it and makes it available uh, through jupyter hub to the user and that's how we can achieve reproducibility of of uh, of the research there is this mybinder.org uh, uh, web where you can or anyone can just go there put the link to the github and we'll produce that thing although that's it's very nice because it's open but it's also limited in, in the resources that is available so with these three kind of basic tools we will uh, build our solution on top of that we will also add two more things coming from from egi uh, or the egi service portfolio the first one would be check-in which is our our identity um, uh, management system is, is basically a, a proxy that allows you to connect your identity from your institution, mainly EduGame, but any community identities, we support lots of them and, and things, we call them social logins, but I mean, it's like Google or Orchid or anything like that. We have a, a plethora of, of those uh, identities available to log into EGI. So we use that for logging into our notebooks uh, service. And besides connecting lots of identity into a single place, it also has some user management capabilities so it allows us to do some authorization and, 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 and makes it easy to authorize users in a common way uh, towards the provider. This is very useful when we want to connect the notebooks, the Jupyter notebooks to other uh, services because as everyone is using the same identity from checking, then the user is the same everywhere and it can be accepted and it's very easy to, to connect new services. And the other thing that we are adding to our solution is this data hub. Uh, it's another service from EGI. This is um, kind of a distributed data solution that is able to move the data around to where you are accessing it. So it's based on, on the concept of a namespace. So your data is, is within a namespace. And if you try to access and it's not available just where you are trying to access it, Data Hub will just move it and make it available for you. So it has this kind of automatic replication of data uh, as needed. And it's based on this one data technology. So with all of this, we put together what we call the EGI notebook service. This is a Jupyter Hub where you can log in with check-in and you will have your environment for, for running your things. We have two main server options, but we, we can talk about customizing this. A default environment with Python, R, Julia, uh, Octave, um, lots of libraries like TensorFlow or Pandas or kind of libraries that people use in, in for data science. And we also have a MATLAB environment. We have a collaboration with MathWorks to make also MATLAB available there. It requires a valid license, and the idea is that uh, with this environment, uh, you can run MATLAB to analyze data sets that are available in EGI. That's the, the, the idea of, the, of adding this here. Once you get in, basically you have the typical JupyterLab um, um, interface. Just I, I just took the screenshot to show you this uh, uh, data hub folder here. Basically, you have a home folder where you can store whatever you want, but you also have this data hub folder where you can access the uh, what I was telling be before the, this data hub service with the different spaces uh, transparently from the notebook so it will be just there and the data will be moved as, as needed um, so technically this is uh, kind of in a simplified way uh, looking like that so we have this EGI notebooks but we are also having this EGI binder which is basically a kind of a replica of the mind binder setup but in, in, in EGI. Uh, all of that runs on, on Kubernetes on top of uh, one of our partner uh, cloud sites as assessment in, in Czech Republic. So that Kubernetes hosts all of the different pieces of the, 
uh, that we use. We have uh, the binder hub solution. Uh, that's the one that is able to take a reference from Zenodo to create the Docker images that will be launched in, in the Jupyter Hub. Jupyter Hub, it's connected to our check-in for identity, so people can log in with uh, check-in and that will authenticate the users, but also provide access tokens that are refreshed automatically for you to access other AVGI services or to access the data hub. Uh, this Jupyter Hub will create spawn Jupyter sessions as, as the user uh, logs in, and these are connected to this local data hub cache, which is replicating the data as needed from, from other providers all across Europe or all, all across the world. And as I said, as we have these tokens, basically you can uh, potentially access any of the other EGI services, so more cloud uh, computing resources, uh, high throughput computing resources, uh, HPC resources, we're looking into adding them also to make them accessible through through these check-in tokens. So potentially from the notebooks environment, you can reach a, a quite extensive uh, a range of um, of services and, and computing resources for, for develop, developing your ideas. So that's the setup. Now we want to do the reproducibility. And the idea is that we want to implement this uh, kind of flow where we have a, a user that starts playing with the EGI notebook service, develops idea, then downloads the, the, the notebook file and wants to share that with others. Uh, the user goes, creates a repository in GitHub, uploads the, the notebook file, adds some requirements .txt, where well, this, this is, can be more than requirements .txt, basically adds configuration for Binder to create the reproducible environment. So it basically leads all the dependencies that are needed to execute that, that notebook. So every time that a new user comes, they will be just installed in the same way. Uh, mm -hmm. With this, <laughs> let okay. us believe I, uh, you know, you, yeah, you yeah. are at the, almost at the top of your minute. Yeah. Uh, so with that, uh, it goes to Zenodo, create a DOI. So create an entry, create a DOI. It's uh, um, in a journal paper. Uh, that's discovered by fellow researchers that can go back to Binder, the EGI Binder, and reproduce everything. And of course, we have this data hub in the middle that is a source of data that can be uh, referenced in, in these notebooks. And this data can also have a DOI, so you can have kind of a very fair kind of um, uh, analysis at the end. So since I am almost over, I will skip this one. Uh, just to tell you, we have uh, now two instances, uh, well, a catch instance that is open. We have do, we do an identity vetting. We don't allow everyone in, just check uh, that you look legitimate. Uh, we have this data hub. Uh, we have some basic uh, uh, capacity for every user, four gigabyte of RAM and, and no limits on the CPU. We don't cut sessions after only after one hour and you have this token to access other services. And we are open to set up this for, for other users. And we are in fact uh, doing that with uh, kind of, uh, uh, pilot communities for this binder, the photon and neutron, the social science uh, and the uh, high, well, astronomy and particle physics communities of EOS, they are looking into testing this uh, and, and uh, asking for new features, I link into community specific data repositories, access to more resources and, and so on. And yeah, basically I'm, I'm over and that's, that's the end, thank you. Thank you so much for your great talk. Um, so any questions for Enol? Hi, hi Sandra, I have a question for Enol. Um, thank you for the presentation. I think towards the very last 30 seconds of your presentation, you mentioned about some involvement of social sciences. Um, can you elaborate a little bit more on that? That sounds really interesting. Uh, yeah, so I... I'm not the one directly in contact with them. So we have um, in the in this EOSC, this European Open Science Cloud, we have what we call the clusters. And there is one which is called the Social Science and Humanities uh, clusters. And we are talking with them specifically with uh, uh, 
uh, two research infrastructure which are called Clarin and Daria. I don't know if you are familiar with them. And they are looking into this binder for, for, for providing a, a reproducible in, uh, an interactive environment for, for data analysis. I don't know exactly what, I can dig it up, uh, but I just don't have the details. So um, if you, if you want, I, I, can, I can look it up and, and, and send you some, some information if you pass your, your email, okay? Sure, I'll send you an email to pull up. Um, I actually have heard of Daria and I actually am um, slightly familiar with EGI, so I'll pull up with you in the email. Thank you. Great, thank you. Perfect. Thank you. A any other question? So I have a question. So I also really like working with Synodo and that it has a connection directly to GitHub. Um, so we have a little bit the situation so that often research domains have their own repositories they also would like to work with. So do you have the same situation? Do you connect Synodo then with domain related repositories or wasn't it a topic yet? For, for... Well, we, um, we, Synodo is part of a, another collaboration also in Europe, which is Open Air. Uh, and Synodo is kind of the open, uh, available for everyone, kind of catch-all instance. But OpenAir has other repositories that are community-specific that uh, have more capacity and, well, they are tailored for them. And we are also hooking into those other uh, repositories. Okay. Um, so we have uh, basically through this OpenAir, we have links to other repositories and we are able to also fetch uh, um, notebooks or other kind of information from them. Oh, cool. Yeah, because I think we have all the same problems there. <laughs> many, many repositories. Any further questions? Thank you so much again for, for the talk. And we are moving to the next talk to 10 techniques for identifying influencers to help promote science gateways and cyber infrastructure for adoption and diffusion. I think Alex Olsansky is giving this talk. Okay, can everyone see my slides? Yes, it looks good. Okay, Let me just minimize this. Okay, um, hi everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be speaking with you all today. My name again is Alex Olshansky. I'll be presenting this work on behalf of my colleagues, Dr. Cassandra Hayes, Chaitra Kulkarni, and Dr. Kirk Key. We come from the College of Media and Communication at Texas Tech University. And again, the title of our talk today is 10 Techniques for Identifying Influencers to Help Promote Science Gateways and Cyber Infrastructure for Adoption and Diffusion. And so in the previous Gateways 2021, we offered a description of science gateways and cyber infrastructure influencers, who they are, what qualities they possess, how they communicate, and why they're successful at influencing others based on a systematic thematic analysis of 132 interviews with CI practitioners from across the country. And so just to recap a little bit from our previous talk at Gateways 2021, when most people think of influencer, they generally think of social media or social media influencers. However, we derive our definition of influencer from Everett Rogers' diffusion of innovations theory concept of opinion leaders. And so Rogers described opinion leaders as having informal influence over other people's attitudes and behaviors. It's kind of what makes them influencers. And then they're also respected by a large number of their peers. They're typically socially well-connected with a network of followers and generally early adopters of new technologies. And so why are these influencers and opinion leaders important for science gateways and cyber infrastructure? Well, if we're interested in widespread adoption and diffusion or spread of technologies like science gateways and cyber infrastructure, then these influencers and opinion leaders play a fundamental role in both removing barriers to change, but also accelerating this adoption and diffusion of science gateways and CI. And so here, we are uh, extending this work based on feedback from the previous gateways, 2021, and uh, offer uh, an additional research question of how can science gateways and CI influencers be identified? And so to address this research question, 
we introduced a framework uh, by Valente and Pampuang, 2007, which was originally developed in a public health context to identify opinion leaders who can affect their peers' health behaviors. Here we're introducing this, these 10 influencer identification techniques in a science gateways and CI context to help accelerate science gateways and CI adoption and diffusion. And so the first technique involves science gateways and CI high flyers. And so this is akin to celebrity endorsements, which involves recruiting well-known science gateways and CI high flyers in different domain communities. And so these are generally well-respected, well-regarded people within their individual domain communities. The second uh, method is self-selection. And so these are when influencers are self-selected volunteers who are recruited through solicitation efforts. And so this is, for example, when there is an open call and people, are volu people volunteer to be ambassadors of your science gateways or CI. The third technique is self-identification in which potential influencers complete a questionnaire which is designed to assess influencer qualities. And so, and so those who receive the top scores are considered as leading influencers. The fourth approach is the positional approach in which persons occupying leadership positions, so like department chairs, for example, are considered as opinion leaders in di different disciplinary departments. The fifth technique is staff selection. And so here, or is a community observation-based selection. So for example, HPC staff uh, can select which persons appear to be influencers based on these staff's opinions. The sixth technique is judges ratings, which utilizes knowledgeable community members as judges to help identify these influencers within their communities. The seventh technique is expert identification. And so this one utilizes trained social scientists uh, to study domain communities from the outside and then identify influencers as outside observers. The eighth technique is called the snowball method. And here, random community members nominate influencers. And then those who are nominated are then interviewed to nominate further influencers. And so the final set of influencers are gonna be those who receive the highest number of nominations. And then this process repeats until uh, a certain number of influencers are achieved. The ninth method is the sociometric or sample sociometric method, which involves utilizing randomly selected respondents from within communities to nominate leaders. And then those receiving frequent nominations are selected as influencers. Or if you were to take a sociometric versus a sample sociometric, this is sampling all or most community members to nominate influencers. And the difference between sample and sociometric is simply a, like a census versus a sample. One is taking a sample, a random sample from a community. The other is um, sampling all, uh, all or most members of a community. And so the 10th technique that we introduce here, we call gossip seeds. And so this is essentially identifying the gossip social butterflies within different communities. And so this essentially is going into different communities and asking people who are the gossipers within these communities and then using those individuals as seeds within different communities. So the influencer identification techniques which are selected will depend on several factors. It'll depend on the specific community in which these influencers reside. It, it will depend on the availability of suitable influencers within these communities. And it'll also depend on the available resources within these communities to implement any of these techniques. So some of the implications from this work and for a successful science gateways and CI diffusion strategy, uh, the use of influencers is imperative. And so here we recommend using multiple of these techniques at any given time and to avoid relying on just one and overusing any particular one. And so one approach is to identify primary and secondary influencers. And so here, some of the techniques that we discussed 
rely on highest scores, but the lower, lower influencer scores need not necessarily be eliminated and may also be useful as influencers. Some of the limitations from this work, and it should be noted that recru uh, recruited influencers may or may not be willing to help promote CI. Of course, we cannot force them. As well, influencers may influence in favor or against your science gateways and CI. In fact, influence is indeed a two-way street. And additionally, not all techniques here consider trust levels, which are a crucial factor when it comes to influence. Uh, similarly, Southwell 2013 argues that individual level, community level, and content level factors also influence how people share and diffuse, diffuse information within their social networks. So these influencers are operating within complex uh, ecosystems where there are many different factors that influence how people adopt and share uh, diffuse technologies. However, here we present a description of methods for identifying potential science gateways and CI influencers why they can be successful at influencing others to adopt, and how we can empirically identify these individuals with the goal of increasing science gateways uh, and CI diffusion. And with that, I thank you all for your attention. Uh, I thank my colleagues for their help working on this project. And I should mention that this project was also funded by an NSF career grant. And with that, I open it up to any questions. Thank you so much, Alex. Any questions? So you can put it in, in the chat or unmute yourself. So one of the questions I would have, so sometimes, you know, dependent on in which community you are also in the domain. And so it's sometimes hard to say which are, you know, the sampling what are the influencers really for, for science gateways? Um, I, I could imagine. So, so with looking at the different characteristics you, you mentioned, so how different is it really between the communities? Let's say whether you are in, in a social sciences community or for example, in computer science. Did, I'm sure you had very different outcomes maybe there. Or oh, maybe not, I don't know. The influencers, they can be different in different communities. They're gonna be um, generally people who are well-regarded, um, but they don't necessarily need to be those kinds of leaders in different communities. They can also be kind of what we mentioned, those kind of lower level gossipers within the community. And so these can be in, in, in different domains, can, communities, they can be either um, end users uh, or they can be, um, domain experts, they can be uh, HPC center administrators. Um, and so they can range in different areas when we're dealing with computer science. Um, and in social science is going to be the same. It can, it can range from uh, both lower level individuals and higher level like um, chairs of departments, for example. Yeah, I, I, yeah. So that there will be different. That it, it's you know, um, I, I think that it makes totally sense. But also, how people would would maybe see a position as influencing. You you know, there are some positions like a director. Okay, that, that is influencing. But I thought more about this. Who you know, who's really influencing in the community when you look at the sampling, like not not dependent on position. I could imagine that you made different experiences there, or, or maybe my, my question is not so clear, sorry. Um, You'll have different motivations for people who yeah, exactly. to sample yeah. and, and have them be influencers. Then people like, for example, those self-identifiers. So people who um, identify themselves as influencers are gonna be mo more motivated, for example, to, to go on and, and, and do more influencing work than people who are selected out of the population. Kirk, did you have any additional thoughts on this? Uh, just maybe a quick response. I, I like uh, this question by Sandra. Perhaps from a disciplinary standpoint, I would say that 
um, if you look at more STEM oriented communities uh, versus let's say social sciences, um, the, uh, an influencer is influential and persuasive because they, they are closer to their near peers. I would say then, I, I would suspect that from a, in the STEM disciplines, maybe the influencers will be more te technologically savvier compared to social scientists and humanities uh, researchers. So when we're identifying influencers, um, perhaps um, it doesn't have to always be, you don't have to always be looking for a, you know, technologically savvy influencer because for some <coughs> um, maybe someone who is not the most savvy, you know, users may, may be more influential to their new peers. Um, so that's my two cents as a co-author with Alex, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And we have two questions also in the chat. So Linda, you, you want to ask your question? Oh, sure. Thanks, Sandra. Uh, and I'm really enjoying the session. Good, good job putting this on. Uh, so I was wondering if you your work had any um, uh, immediate application to the workforce development within the gateway community specifically or STEM fields in general. Yeah, so um, the, the you're talking about influencers particularly? Yes. Yeah, so in, influencers are also um, important for workforce development because without these kinds of um, bringing change or uh, influencing change, these are, how do I say it, gatekeepers um, for interventions, uh, influencers are. And so without these kinds of opinion leaders, without these uh, influencers, there's these individuals would not have otherwise known about these fields to go into or have being have their attitudes changed about certain domains or certain areas of CI in which they want to go into. And so this they're they're important for workforce development in that way. So they are important, you're saying, because they expose the students to, or the, so their primary role will be the exposure. For exposure and as well as just influencing um, people to kind of adopt these technologies and become either end users or developers of this kind of technology. Okay, thank you. Thank you, and Mike, would you like to ask your question? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> suppose I want to hire staff to do this, to coordinate this influence for a gateway effort. Um, do you think it has to be somebody who already knows this community? Or if not, how long do you expect, how long would I expect it to take somebody to get up to speed enough to do this effectively? That's a great question. Um, I think people who are already within the community may, it, it may have more face validity when they are identifying influencers because they're more familiar with the people in the community and who has influence and who doesn't. Um, however, it's, it, it may be also useful to have someone from outside of the community uh, come in and observe and notice who are the, the influencers from the outside. As, as I mentioned, one of, our, uh, one of the techniques was having outside social scientists come in as trained social scientists to identify influencers within communities. And so, as far as timeline as getting up to speed, um, that I, I don't think I will be able to answer. I don't know if Kirk has any thoughts on that, but um, yeah, go ahead, Kirk. I'll be happy to jump in a little bit. <clears throat> Mike, that's a great question. I think some of the um, methods such as the social metric and snowball techniques that Alex talked about could be methods that someone familiar with the method could implement rather quickly. They just be, you know, reaching out to community members and ask them to nominate who do they believe to be influential within their community. So I think that kind of approach doesn't um, doesn't need to wait. It could, you know, take take place rather quickly within just a couple of weeks of preparation. I would imagine if it is fast. But I think that longer the person has been in the community, the longer they will have the contextual understanding of the domain to help them arrive at more robust and sophisticated interpretation of who are these influencers, their trust level with the community, and um, uh, like even connected to what 
uh, I, I suggested earlier about their technological competence and how much others can relate with them uh, within that domain culture to be for them to be influential. So I think that it will be you can actually employ both a short term and long term approach. Short term, very quickly, just identify who are these possible. Um, influencer, and even the gossip seeds approach, just basically identify who are the social butterflies. If you want to spread go gossips within this domain community, who would you go to? So I, I would say both, you know, you can get someone started quickly, but the longer the person has been in the domain, the more they would contextually understand the domain. <laughs> okay, that word gossiper makes me, gossiper makes me laugh. But uh, <laughs> um, just to get us down in the weeds a little bit, um, I promise not to keep us there. How, once you identify these influences, do you then make use of them within your organization? Are they consultants? Are they um, speakers? Are they, you know, I don't know. There's so there's, there's some aspect of first identifying them and then like recruiting them and then training them to 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 be champions per se of of specific domains or technologies um and so um there is some aspect of, of training involved um but not not in all the, in not every recruited um influencer will go through a certain training but um I hope that does that answer your question. Yeah. So they and then after that they become consultants or paid or some way, and then I'll stop. They, they can they can be consultants or they can just go. They usually go about their normal um, their normal lives, but they they do so while influencing others. They they actively recruit students, for example or they're promoting this technology to others in their, in their departments or in, in their colleges or elsewhere. So thank you very much for, for the lively discussion. So I hope you will stay around for the social session and if there are still questions um, that, that people can continue discussing about the topic, that would be cool. Because I would like to introduce our um, last but not least talk um, for, for the session and this is yeah of course now i have don't find my tab again with the program <laughs> so it's about scientific web application templates and nicole who i will give the talk hi sandra thank you hi nicole <laughs> So you should be able to share your screen. Okay. You see it. Okay. Are we good? Looks good. All right. Uh, so I am Nicole Brewer, and I'm a software engineer at Purdue University, and I'm presenting alongside Rajesh Kalyanam, Robert Campbell, Carol Song, and Lan Zhao. Um, and I'm talking about scientific web applications. So this is a name uh, that could probably also go by a gateways tool. I'd say they're kind of synonymous, um, depending, you know, on your on your perspective. Maybe if you're a scientist, you might call it a scientific web application. Um, but scientific web apps are user interfaces that allow users to perform some sort of data analysis or computation. Um, so they are uh, like this one is just tab-based. Uh, I'm going to talk more about how this is deployed with Jupyter and IPy widgets. Um, but essentially, we want to take scientific code and wrap it up so it is more accessible to uh, other scientists or, or people that might want to access some code or computational tool. 
so you can see this one's tab based and we flip through it uh, to go through certain stages of computation or data processing. So the mo motivation for this kind of work uh, is in our group is that it's become more popular. Um, we're getting more requests for it and um, it's being seen as a more legitimate type of publication tool. And it can probably improve the accessibility of things like data or HPC resources and uh, other components of cyber infrastructure, particularly if it's deployed on a gateway. Um, we can improve reusability of data or software and maybe reproducibility if that was taken into account when we uh, started to design the app. And we've worked on a lot of these. So uh, we've, we've worked in biology and economics uh, and many more. Um, they're all relatively simple and they're all, they've all been tab based. Uh, so we're just clicking through and most of them we're filtering through data. Um, and we're uh, using GUI components to cover up pieces of code that you might see in a traditional Jupyter notebook. Um, so for us, a scientist might come to us with Python or uh, a Jupyter notebook, but there's a lot of code exposed. And what we do is we cover it with widgets so that there isn't any interactive code left to play with. And then we deploy that Jupyter notebook um, either on a gateway or um, by some other means so that it is a standalone web application. Um, another common theme to these tools is that frequently the researchers want to inherit the code and maintain it for themselves after we've developed it. Uh, so that is also Part of our choice for choosing a Jupyter notebook as opposed to some other tool. Uh, we want the researcher to be able to inherit it and maybe extend it or even develop their own new tool from it later. Um, so for this reason, uh, notebooks has generally been a good idea in our case for rapid development of these types of tools. Um, when we're not deploying on a gateway, we're often deploying on some composable system that runs on Kubernetes. Um, but in even in a simple case, you could even deploy on my binder for free. Um, but things get more complicated when you need things like uh, access to data and HPC resources. So when we need users or we need shared data between users, then we can throw it up on a gateway. Um, now, the way that we uh, build these is um, typically there's more code involved than will fit into a single notebook. So our, um, our first strategy was to offload our code into Python files, and then we just use a single cell notebook to uh, call a model view controller and uh, launch the GUI from that single cell notebook. Um, and that all worked uh, really well. And we've got a template that uh, I would encourage you to use and I can post the link after this talk. Um, I was working on a particular case um, where the scope kind of creeped quite a bit. And uh, the application required a lot of composability. So I had a lot of uh, components that needed to be repeated places in the application. So um, uh, what I, the, so then the design uh, of my MVC became a little more critical and I adapted um, the model delegate design pattern. Uh, so in this pattern, we have a model that's totally separate from a view. 
and um, we create a delegate that inherits the view to handle events and to communicate with the model. And the model is um, uh, the the model is a part of the delegate. Um, so the benefit to this is that these pieces are composable. So I can write several uh, you know, view, uh, views that represent the same model, but look very different. And they can all exist in the same application and manipulate the same model. And um, that's, that can be really beneficial uh, particularly as the application got a lot bigger. Um, so the summary here is uh, that this allowed us to separate concerns in a way that was really scalable. So if you're thinking to yourself, well, this application might start small, but if it grows bigger, is the Jupyter Notebook going to be able to handle that? If you start with this design, perhaps it might. Um, so if I've convinced you that Jupyter Notebooks are a good choice for tools, um, what I have done is taken our original template and uh, modified it for this kind of composable design um, and also added some opinionated development choices that uh, make working with this design easier. Um, so one problem that uh, uh, working with widgets presents is you have to go through this kind of annoying process of you change a single line of code and you save it and you restart and you rerun the notebook. And it takes a while to load, especially as the application gets bigger in scope. And you have to click through everything to make sure that it looks right or updated it the way you want it to. Um, so I found this to be kind of annoying. And I started working directly in Jupyter Notebooks to work on each little component individually. And then I would copy and paste that code into my, <laughs> into my Python files. Um, and that was quite annoying as well. So I finally found a solution after listening to a podcast called, uh, uh, the solution is called uh, nope, NB Dev standing for notebook development. And it allows you to develop all your code within notebooks and then export that code to Python files. So this way I could develop the entire application within Jupyter Notebooks and play with all the interactivity um, without doing a whole lot of copying, pasting, or waiting on the notebook to reload. Uh, and this ended up having a lot of other nice advantages. Um, it's very literate, so you can leave in all the markdown cells. And um, so the person who inherits it can kind of uh, read through it like a book if you've uh, done the work that way. And uh, it has automatic uh, documentation generation. Uh, and if you're concerned about things like diffs and merge with Jupyter Notebooks, uh, it does take care of issues you might anticipate for that kind of thing. It also has inline testing, so you can run tests in the notebooks uh, as it becomes apparent to you that you might need a test, and uh, you can run these tests separately from uh, converting the Jupyter Notebooks to Hello. Am I still there? You are on the NV death side, yeah. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> my <laughs> my my uh my screen just went away. I don't know where my zoom went. So I was <laughs> I'm glad that I'm not gone. Um Right. Uh, 
So and by the way, of... beep. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, yeah, so uh, also if you might be worried about some other uh, things that you might be missing from your IDE, Jupyter Lab ships with a lot of these things. Um, a, you know, a lot of these things are personal choice, but the this template that I've made ships with these things um, to make development easier for you. So hopefully I've convinced you that um, tools are a good idea and that Jupyter notebooks are a good way to deploy them. Um, I have hopefully convinced you that the model delicate design helps make your uh, notebook development more composable and scalable. And that for all these reasons that using this template is a good way to speed up your next developed tool. So uh, here is the QR code for the template. It's got Docker files uh, for all the environments you might need. Please go give it a star. Um, and thank you very much for letting me present. Thank you, Nicole. Thank you for a great talk. So any questions for Nicole? So I, I, I have a question. So, so these notebooks are of course really taking up in the, in the community and it's so helpful. Have you seen cases where you think Oh, this is really good to do it directly in Jupyter, or this is good to add it maybe not to the notebook, but to something, you know, because I know you you work also with Carol together on to add it more like in a portal or science gateway like my GeoHub. Is there something where you say, ah, oh, this is good for for this solution and the template, and this is better maybe really to integrate it in a different environment? Uh, yeah, I kind of interpreted that two ways. Do you mean um, where to deploy it or? Where to deploy it, yes. Okay, yeah. So I think the deployment is, <laughs> is we, we have like, we've considered like a whole matrix of um, possible needs and what makes an ideal deployment for those set of needs. Um, so for these particular cases, um, uh, you know, there's minimal needs, but um, not um, not trivial, right? So if I only had C CSV files, I could use my binder to take this notebook and host it for free. Um, but for many of these examples, uh, the thing that makes it need a Jupyter or a science gateway deployment is the need for shared data and users. Uh, presumably HPC resources, although I don't think, um, I'm not sure if we've actually done that, but um, so yeah, certainly de depending on the needs, um, the, <laughs> the more needs you have, the, the more complex the solution gets and, and gateway Growing up on a gateway is a very good middle of the line solution, I think. Cool. So there's one question by Ryan. Ryan, you would like to speak up? Um, yeah, I can I can say it out loud. Sorry, I had a mic issue. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Nicole. I was just wondering if you've tried other options like uh, the one I use the most is Streamlit for these like little web app things. I use it in uh, teaching chemistry, different little little web apps. But yeah, I was just wondering if you've tried other options and what your thoughts were on Voila versus versus any of the other options. Thanks. Um, so is that to deploy or to de uh, like to develop? Yeah, I guess more developing i mean deploying i guess i would assume it would be i don't know i guess i've deployed those like streamlit and stuff like that i guess i haven't deployed any of the voila things but more de more developing like how yeah doing it all in the notebooks versus uh yeah any of these other ones sure i mean i i uh, don't have a 
ton of personal experience outside of um, notebooks for this sort of application. Um, so I can't really speak to that. Um, also, yeah, I'm, I'm not even sure what other uh, things that Wola is compatible with. So I'm not sure that I can give you a very good answer. Thanks, sorry, I was just, want, yeah, just, just wondering, <laughs> thanks. Okay. So Rob ha has an opinion about that. <laughs> so Rob, you would like to speak up or? Oh, I just uh, wanted to emphasize that uh, the, the whole driver for using Voila is, uh, is IPy widgets. IPy widgets uh, really is a, a great way for um, uh, developers that maybe aren't versed in classic web development, you know, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, Ajax, that sort of thing, to be able to, to, to have interactive widgets in their, in their tools and their web-based tools without a whole lot of uh, experience. Uh, in in classical web based, based stuff, so that that's really the driver for Voila for me. Sci-fi widgets. Thanks. Thanks. 